up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Thank you guys for allowing me the time last week to spend time with family. So for today's video, we will be speaking about the disappearance of Marilyn Renee Nicole McCowan and she was referred to as Nikki. So that is how I will be referring to her for the rest of today's video. And despite her disappearance, leaving behind pretty much no clues at all, it genuinely seems like she just vanished into thin air. Um, it ends up becoming very twisted. I feel like this is one of those where if you look at it at first glance, you could pretty clearly see, oh, this is absolutely what happened. These people had to be responsible. But then the deeper that you dive, it's almost like the more you have to know to understand exactly what's going on. And three different individuals close to her, just one after another, ended up becoming persons of interest in her case. Every time someone was uncovered, it shocked me equally as much as the time before. Now, unfortunately, the one individual out of those three um, that has not been ruled out as a person of interest and is the one that has and according to investigators now, thought to be the one that was involved in her disappearance, um, he is no longer alive. So Nikki's family is really relying on someone that was close to him at the time to come forward with information. So I felt like this story was very, very important to get out there. Plus her family has worked endlessly endlessly to keep her story alive and I really wanted to make sure she had a permanent place on my channel. Before I dive into the details of this case, I want to say a huge thank you to Audible for sponsoring today's video. Audible has gotten me through some very difficult times the past couple of months. Um, if you're not aware of what Audible is, they are the leading provider of spoken word entertainment, including audiobooks, Audible originals, news, comedy even, and more. There are hundreds of titles to choose from across multiple different genres, such as true crime, fiction, biographies, history, there's something out there for absolutely everyone. I'm currently in the process of listening to an audiobook called Blind Justice, and I know you guys are probably so sick and tired of my kick when it comes to wrongful convictions. I am just so in that bubble right now and I really wanted to understand more about wrongful convictions from a different side than just what I was seeing and I hit the mother load when it comes to audiobooks. The audiobook is by a man named Mark Godsey who is a former prosecutor and he dives deep into the psychology and politics behind wrongful convictions. I highly suggest this audiobook, you guys. He speaks a lot about system confirmation, um, cognitive dissonance, which a lot of you guys speak to me about in my DMs constantly, dehumanization, which is something that I speak about a lot. And then one thing that's always been so fascinating and also irritating to me because I know some of the reality behind it already, but that is memory malleability. As I've always said, I am just absolutely in love with Audible, you guys. I'm constantly on the go, in the car, in the gym, taking walks, doing housework. I'm never not doing something and it's really easy to just throw on an audiobook and be able to listen to something that I'm very interested in while trying to get things done. Right now with social distancing and school closures and a lot of extra time on our hands, Audible wanted to make sure that you guys have easy access to stories and titles to help first of all reduce stress and also to stay entertained. So they have created something called stories.audible.com where there are hundreds and hundreds of titles that you guys can have access to for free. You do not even have to be a member. You can access them no matter what, which I think is absolutely awesome. And then for those that are members, instead of having only two Audible Originals that you get to choose from monthly, two free Audible Originals, you have access to the entire monthly selection. If you want to become a member, all you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash Danielle, or you can text Danielle to 500 500 and you will get one free audiobook, unlimited Audible Originals right now, as well as a 30 day free trial. Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring today's video and now into the case. Nikki was one of, I believe, nine, eight or nine children growing up in Richmond, Indiana, and she was known by her father and described by her father as the one child of his that could get herself out of absolutely anything. She was a firecracker. She was independent. She was smart. She was driven. She could always hold her own. If she set a goal, she accomplished that goal, period. There was no changing her mind. It usually happened. She was very smart, loved school, and excelled a lot in school, and she had a huge interest in criminal justice from a very young age. So she specifically wanted to end up in the FBI or in the US Marshals, 
but she also really, really wanted a family. She grew up in a very large family. It was something that she was used to and she could not wait to get married, couldn't wait to be a mom. And she ended up finding her very first love who she would end up back with when she entered into high school. She met someone named Robert Webster and I will refer to him as Bobby for the rest of the video. She met him when she was 14, I believe at the time he was a senior and it was a very tricky situation for Nikki because again, she was mellow, like she was just chill, doing her own thing, you know, trying to destroy school to crush all of her goals for the future. Um, but of course she's attracted to this one guy that's known to be a player. And he had a lot of girls in his back pocket and then all these girls ended up harassing and bullying Nikki, but she was just the kind of person where she let this stuff roll off. There were a few incidents where she had to be walked out of work by a security guard because some of these girls were not happy with her at all. But again, she was just someone that could hold her own. So she ended up dating Bobby on and off for the next three years while continuing on through high school and she really really seemed to like him but then just as she was I think entering into her senior year of high school and at this point he's far out of high school he decided to move away to California and while this was obviously upsetting for Nikki because she did really really like him she kind of just saw it as an opportunity to focus on herself and excel in all the things that she wanted to do. Nikki graduated from high school and got a job and then met another man that swept her off her feet and his name was Steven Johnson. They ended up moving in together and had a little girl named Peyton, I believe by the time Nikki was 19 years old. And while the relationship was great at first, Steven ended up losing his job. So Nikki as a mother to a very young child and she was only 19 or 20 years old at the time, it was very difficult because she was the one who was solely supporting her entire family and it put a whole lot of strain on her, a whole lot of strain on her relationship with Steven and it made it worse because Steven did not seem very interested in finding another job and on top of that, even by his own admittance, he cheated on Nikki multiple times, he was abusive to her at times, it was not a good relationship, so she decided to move on with her life, so she left him. But it was Nikki and Nikki always had space in her heart for everyone and always wanted the best for those that she cared about. So because she wanted her daughter to live a great life and see her parents respect each other no matter the situation, they had a pretty good relationship. They continued to work together and show their daughter that they could move forward in a positive way despite everything that happened. So now Nikki yet again was back solely focusing on herself and her daughter and her life, you guys. It was great. It was exactly what she wanted. She got a job at the Montgomery Education and Pre-Release Center, which was a prison, and she started off as a guard. I think that's where most people would start off there, and she eventually ended up being head of accounting, but all of her superiors very quickly saw her skill and her passion for what she was doing. So she ended up being put on the hostage negotiation team, and she could not be more excited about what was happening. While working at the correctional facility and being a single mother to her young daughter Peyton, she was also attending Sinclair Community College and while she was there she was taking you guessed it, criminal justice classes. And it was no surprise at all that she was on the Dean's list. So she was juggling it all, making her dreams happen. And suddenly the puzzle pieces came even more together. Bobby ended up coming back from California and pretty much as he describes it, the second he came back, they reignited their flame and were back together. They both had goals that they were pushing towards in life. They both had grown up a whole lot. They both still felt very strongly about each other. He was very supportive of Peyton. Bobby supported all of her dreams and was still just as in love with her drive and passion for life as he always had been. So he asked her to marry him. Her life was coming together exactly how she had always wanted it to, but three weeks before her wedding, Nikki vanished, and to this day, nobody knows where she is. It was Sunday, July 22nd, 2001. Nikki was 28 years old at the time. I believe Peyton was eight years old or nine years old, and she was busy with home life and finishing up plans for the wedding, as was Bobby. And that day, Bobby had specific plans after the morning, I think they went to church that morning, to go with his cousin to get the tuxedo fitted. I think 
he said that some men that were part of his wedding party had really been lazy about getting that stuff done. And so he was gonna go with them to make sure it actually happened. Nikki, on the other hand, was going to do what she pretty much did every single Sunday. She was going to go down to the local coin laundry, do all of their laundry while waiting for Bobby to finish up. And then that night they were supposed to meet back together to finish up wedding invitations. Bobby decided to let Nikki take his larger GMC 4x4 car so that she could more easily fit the laundry in the back. And he took her smaller car since he wouldn't need all the space. He told her he would be back around 4.30 at 5 o'clock and they could do the invitations from there. At around 12 p.m. they headed separate ways. Nikki first dropped Peyton off at her parents' house because her parents' house was very, very close to the laundromat and she wanted to be able to get this done without Peyton having to sit and wait with her. Um, and then after that, she headed down to the coin laundry. After the wash cycles were done, she swapped everything over to the dryer and decided to go to her parents' house while she waited. And this was something else that she would typically do. It was just so close. We all know that the drying cycle takes absolutely forever sometimes. Um, so she would head there and hang out and then she would go back and get her clothes. However, this time when she arrived, Barbara, her mother, and her sister Tammy realized that Nikki was not quite acting herself. She seemed very upset, agitated, and when they asked her what on earth was going on, she said that there were two men that were at the laundromat that were harassing her. Her mom offered for her to bring her clothes back to her home to use their dryer to finish things up, but Nikki being typical Nikki said that she could handle it and she headed out to go gather her clothes. She told her mom she would come back to get Peyton and she was off. But Nikki never showed back up. Her mom originally believed that she likely decided to go to work. She worked 40 minutes away in Dayton, Ohio. That's where the correctional facility was. And I guess just because she was so passionate about what she did and how much she loved her job, she occasionally would either get called in or she would head in herself to just kind of finish up a few things, see if there was anything at all she could do. Um, and this is genuinely what her mom thought was happening. And she believed that whenever Nikki got the chance, she would call to let her know when she would come to pick up Peyton. At around 4.30, 30 p.m. Bobby ended up getting home and he noticed that Nikki was not home yet. Again, not a huge deal at first. Nikki was independent. She did her own thing. She, you know, also was the kind of person that if she needed to get things done, she wasn't waiting on anyone else to do it. So he believed that she may have been at a friend's house talking about the wedding or she had gone to pick up a few last minute things and that she would be home later. Bobby started to watch a show on TV and got wrapped up in it. And all of a sudden it was 6 p.m. and he noticed that Nikki was still not home. Bobby right off the bat felt like something was wrong. I'm assuming just because when you are in a relationship with someone, you know their patterns, you know what's normal and what's not, you see them every single day. Um, and he knew that her not showing up when they were supposed to do the invitations didn't seem very normal. So he decided to go ahead and call around to different people, friends, family to see if they had seen Nikki. By the time nine o'clock rolled around, her family still hadn't seen her, Bobby still hadn't seen her, no one had heard from her, and it was very clear that at this point she wasn't making any last minute purchases for the wedding and she definitely had not gone to work. Bobby, while looking for any sign of her in the home, realized that she had left her purse and her ID on the bedside table. And if she was just going down to the laundromat, that's one thing, but it would be very unlike her to leave those things or not come back for those things if she planned on going all the way to Ohio. Bobby again called her family and Peyton still also had not been picked up. So at this point, everyone was like, you know what, we need to do something. We need to see if we can locate her. Barbara called Steven to come and pick up Peyton, who was also very concerned as to why Nikki had not shown up that day. He also knew this was very unlike her and everyone decided to meet at Nikki's parents' home to decide what they wanted to do. The first thing they decided to do was call around to local hospitals because every single one of them thought that the only logical explanation to Nikki not showing up not calling was that she must have been in some sort of accident. But every single hospital they called led to a dead end. So they next decided to go out and drive between the parents' house and the coin laundry, taking different roads to see if maybe her car was broken down on the side of the road, but they found absolutely nothing. As the night went on, more people decided to go and take the drive between the laundromat and Dayton, Ohio, where the correctional facility was, the same route that she would have taken to get there had she gone to work. And still, there was absolutely no sign of Nikki and no sign of her car. 
Finally, by around 11 p.m., Nikki's dad said it was time to file a missing persons report because, again, he knew this was his daughter that could handle anything, that could get out of any situation, and this meant something bad had to have happened. Went down to the Richmond Police Department, but were unfortunately told that they would need to wait 72 hours to report Nikki as missing. I guess they told authorities the very basic information about Nikki um, and that she you know, was an adult and she was three weeks away from her wedding and this was so unlike her and authorities pretty much chalked it up to, oh, she's getting cold feet. You know, this is, this is normal. She'll come back. She's probably stressed out and taking a little bit of a break. But despite her family's objections to this idea, knowing how badly she wanted to get married and how excited she was, pretty much when she wasn't working, she was planning the wedding. They couldn't convince authorities to do anything. So they went home and decided to start searching for themselves. The following day, they gathered friends and family and again started to head in different locations around the town to look for Nikki and look for the vehicle. Michelle's daughter's father, and I hope I got that right, um, he actually worked at the correctional facility as well. So she went down there and she was let in and she asked, you know, did Nikki ever show up for work? Because she had a shift early that morning and Nikki, again, loved her job. She had never missed a day of work. Again, she, sh she showed up there even when she wasn't needed. So they kind of knew everything was hanging in the balance of her showing up to work that day. And she never showed up. And this is when authorities finally kind of realized, you know what, maybe something is actually wrong here. Maybe this is more than cold feet. Nikki's family started to gather search teams. They put out flyers and they made t-shirts and police slowly began to start looking into her disappearance. However, I've seen the family say that they didn't do anything big until about three weeks after Nikki had disappeared. Once authorities did actually hit the ground running, they used a lot of different search tactics. I know that they went door to door and were asking people, you know, have you seen her? I know they checked door to door around the laundromat to see if anyone there saw or heard anything. They got a helicopter to fly over Richmond to see if they could find the car from above. But unfortunately, every single thing they came back empty handed. Because Nikki had stated that there were two men harassing her at the laundromat, the idea at this point was, okay, these two men had something to do with her disappearance. When authorities went to the employees of the laundromat, they said that there were no issues that day. There were no men that appeared to be harassing anyone. Um, and I don't think there was ever any surveillance footage that was captured from the laundromat itself. It could have been, but maybe it was you know written over at this point. Um, but basically, they couldn't figure out if these men existed. There was nothing else to corroborate this story. There was no evidence of these men. So they were really stuck at square one and figuring every single thing out from scratch because there seemed to be no evidence left behind. They couldn't even find the vehicle she was in that day. Authorities checked her bank account as well and there were no signs at all of activity on it. Um, I'm not sure if she took her card or cash, maybe just put it in her pocket to go to the laundromat. But again, her purse and everything were still at the home. I've also seen here that they checked her cell phone records and didn't find anything, but I still haven't figured out if she actually had a cell phone or not. I've seen conflicting information on that. Um, but then they end up finding a bit of security footage. And again, this is where things get a little bit foggy. On the True Crime Daily episode, investigators said that they ended up finding footage from a convenience store across the road from the laundromat and showed Nikki pulling up and coming inside, purchasing a few items and leaving and that she was not under any state of duress. She did not look upset or anything at all. The way they described it made it seem like this footage was captured after she finally left the laundromat. So it would indicate that no one took her from the laundromat itself, that she was fine, didn't appear stressed or upset as if those men were still harassing her at that point in time. But, but I've also listened to the Trace Evidence podcast of this case and he stated that this footage was actually taken from a deli. It could be the same place, just like a different label thrown on it. And he stated that the timestamp on it actually shows that she was there before she even went to her mother's house. I wasn't able to find anything that really verified either bits of information, um, but at least at some point she was seen at this convenience store deli completely fine. But while they felt they had no answers and all their searches were not providing them with any more information, very quickly Nikki's family and authorities started to look toward one person based on very odd behavior, Bobby. So while the searches were going on, her family noticed that Bobby 
was acting strange. They said that typically people involved in a search, they don't care what they look like, they show up, they all looked a mess because they were emotionally distraught, they were physically exhausted, they'd been searching through, you know, streets in the middle of summer, they were going through overgrown areas, wooded areas, but Bobby always showed up dressed as if he were ready for his appearance on the news. He centered himself in pretty much all of the different interviews with news stations and um, they just felt like even though all this was happening, Bobby was always pristine. Bobby was always clean. And from what I've seen, he was still helping with the searches. They just wondered if he was more focused on being on television. However, that wasn't even the largest concern out of all of them. Apparently days after Nikki went missing, Bobby started to entirely cancel the wedding. Like within days, he made phone calls to the reception venue and demanded full refunds for that. He also attempted to return both of the wedding rings. I've seen that he was not successful in this because Nikki's name was on the receipt, um, but he did try. He even allegedly called Nikki's school to inquire about her student loan um, and it, it was reported by them that he was trying to get the money from her student loan. So this is a huge red flag. I totally see it. Obviously, family totally saw it. Authorities saw it. And everyone believed that Bobby should have been a wreck. And he should have been searching endlessly for his fiance that he claimed to love so much. But instead, it seemed like he was trying to be on the news and was immediately canceling the wedding to try to put money in his pocket. Because of this, authorities decided to bring him in for questioning. Plus, I think that's just kind of common procedure, especially in a situation like that where you're weeks away from a wedding, people can maybe change their mind and feel very extreme about it. They just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything going on here. So Bobby was very, very cooperative the entire time. He told them the events about his day that provided him with an alibi for a certain period of time. I don't know if he had like a full alibi for when he allegedly was sitting there watching television, um, but either way, he said that the last thing on his mind was the wedding at that point in time. And the reason why he did all of those different things was to actually get money for things like a reward and for searches. They apparently were still making payments to the um, venue for the wedding and also the rings were still being paid off and they were on layaway at the time and he just figured those resources would be much better elsewhere. So that's why he did all that. And he said that he did in fact call the school to inquire about Nikki's financial aid, but he said that he wasn't calling to try to get the funds from the financial aid. He also said when it came to the rings in particular, he was hoping that those rings, getting the money from that would allow him to buy a cell phone. He didn't have one at the time and he said it was very, very difficult while he was out searching to keep in contact with the family and keep in contact with the police department so he thought that would just be um, a very effective tool when it came to the searches for Nikki. They asked Bobby to take a polygraph test and he immediately agreed to it, but he ended up showing signs of deception. And this really made authorities question again these reasonings that he had given behind his actions. You know, maybe it's just a cover, but with no evidence and a decent alibi for majority of the day, they couldn't really do much. So he was simply labeled as a person of interest and they moved on. Now, Bobby has since spoken about the questions that he was apparently deceptive on in the polygraph test and he stated they were all questions asking if he was responsible for Nikki's disappearance. And he said that the reason it likely showed deception is because he felt partially responsible because he was her fiance. He was someone that was supposed to protect her from bad things happening and he felt like he had failed her. He used that same reasoning with another thing Nikki's family was upset about. Apparently just days after all this happened, again, he washed Nikki's car, took it to the wash, completely washed it. And I understand why that's very alarming. Um, it makes you kind of think, okay, are you trying to clean up evidence or what is exactly is going on? But Bobby simply said, it's just the same exact thing. I had promised her that I would do this for her that day. He had forgotten to do it that Sunday and he felt like he owed it to her to do it. He felt like he'd already failed her in other ways. So he explained away washing the car with that. So at this point, authorities have exhausted all leads. They got nowhere with Bobby and nothing came of the two men that were allegedly harassing Nikki at the laundromat. 
Her family even wondered at this point if this idea that these two people at the laundromat was maybe a cover for another reason why she was upset that day, but there was nothing more than this. And the case went quiet until three months later on October 3rd, when her GMC 4x4 was located. It was parked in Dayton, Ohio at the Meadows of Catalpa apartment complex. The vehicle itself appeared to be in okay condition. It didn't appear that anything had gone wrong on the outside of it. And when they opened it up, they actually found the laundry from that day still neatly folded in the back. But other than that, the inside of the vehicle also appeared fine. It didn't appear there was any struggle. You couldn't visibly see any blood. So they decided to go ahead and send it off for forensic testing, thinking, okay, someone dumped this car here. There's gotta be prints or DNA or blood or something. But the car came back entirely clean and even the seat itself was in the position it would have been had Nikki been sitting in the driver's seat. So it genuinely appeared as if she had parked it there and then just vanished. I think, I think the ignition was tampered with and I do believe the radio was taken, but I don't think they believe those were linked to whatever may have happened or at least it did not give them any sort of clues and they didn't find any prints or anything like that but the car did give them a little bit of information. It wasn't parked at just any apartment complex. It was parked in the same apartment complex that Steven Johnson, Peyton's father, lived in. This made authorities very suspicious, obviously, of Steven because, you know, maybe he's upset because his child's mother is marrying someone else. So they decided to bring Steven in for questioning. And just like Bobby, he had a solid alibi and he ended up passing his polygraph test with flying colors. So he was very cooperative and gave authorities everything they needed and more. And despite the odd fact that the car she was in just so happened to be parked at the same apartment complex he lived in, authorities chalked it up to just being coincidence. But still, they ended up hitting another bit of crazy information. A quarter mile down the road from this apartment complex lived another man named Tommy Swint. And this man, was not anywhere near as cooperative as the other two. According to Nikki's sister, Michelle, Tommy was not a great person. Um, Nikki had made a phone call that day to Tommy Swint's girlfriend, who he lived with at the time. They both lived near the meadows of Catalpa apartment complex. So there was a lot of speculation by her sister, Michelle, that Nikki went over to Tommy Swint's apartment and his girlfriend's apartment that day after finishing up her laundry. Apparently, Nikki had been on the hunt for these hair, skin, and nail vitamins, and um, Nikki's sister believes that maybe this coworker, this girlfriend, had them, and that's what the conversation was about, and maybe she went to go and pick these up, and then something happened. I'll speak more about that later, but regardless, Tommy was a problem. Nikki and Tommy worked together at the correctional facility. So all three worked at the same place. And Nikki always saw Tommy as an older brother figure. She was warned by a handful of people that Tommy was not someone that she wanted to be involved with in any way, shape or form. He was known for treating women very badly. He was known to have a temper, but Nikki was the kind of person that genuinely believed the best of everyone. And initially he seemed like a really great person to her. So she gave him a chance. However, according to her friends and family, uh, he thought of her as more than just a friend. There were a lot of rumors flying around, according to friends, family, and also investigators. Um, and I think they were going around the correctional facility and obviously within the friend and family group that they were having some sort of secret relationship. But when people look deeper into it, it seemed like a very one-sided thing that he was borderline obsessive over her. She was happily engaged and she was not interested in him in that way at all. And her sister even witnessed something that was very frightening at some point before her disappearance. Michelle decided to go over to Nikki's apartment one day, just randomly wanted to go over and say hi. And as she approached the apartment, she heard Nikki screaming for help. And when she rushed inside the apartment, she saw Tommy Swint standing over Nikki and Nikki had her foot up against his chest and was like trying to get him away from her. 
I don't know any more details about this occurrence, but I do know that Nikki ended up telling her sister that she thought she was about to be sexually assaulted, that he was trying to come on to her and she was denying it and he was not listening. But that's just one example of how Tommy did very inappropriate things towards Nikki um, that were unwanted. Just before Nikki disappeared, she had a bridal shower and Tommy got her a present of very risque lingerie. And it was shocking to everyone who saw this present that he would give her something like this. Him as a male would give this woman about to get married to another man lingerie. But while his choice of present was odd, the worst thing about it, honestly, was that he wasn't even invited to this bridal shower. He sent Nikki this lingerie through the mail and it was very, very disturbing for her and very disturbing for the people that knew about it. Um, he was just crossing a whole lot of lines. Now, authorities worried at this point that maybe Tommy had something to do with Nikki's disappearance because again, clearly he had some sort of um, attraction to her, romantic attraction to her. Clearly he did not care if she did not want it because he had been attempting to sexually assault her. And they, so they brought him in for questioning and essentially he escaped every single question. He was either completely ignoring what they were saying or he was only partially answering their questions or when they'd answer, he would talk about something entirely different to redirect the conversation. And I don't even think authorities were able to give him a polygraph test. I'm assuming because speaking with him was so wildly chaotic that it never, it never even got anywhere. But at this point, just like the other two, they had absolutely no evidence at all connecting him to her disappearance, just these stories about him and they couldn't force him to speak to them or do anything. So he was just labeled as a main person of interest. And again, they kept on moving. At this point, the case went cold. They had absolutely no leads. There was no more evidence that was found. Um, the persons of interest they had, two of them seemed to, you know, be explainable, but the other was very uncooperative and sketchy, but they couldn't get any more information out of anyone. And Nikki's family just kept doing everything they could to keep her name in the media. They wanted to make sure people didn't forget about her, make sure that information was spreading. They held vigils every single year out front of the coin laundry. They spoke to the news whenever they could. Her daughter even went on the news and spoke multiple times. They, I think, flew out to New York and they were on a television show about it. There is an episode on Disappeared. Wherever they could go to make sure people heard Nikki's story, they went. But then three years later, an unexpected breakthrough happened. And it didn't even start with Nikki's case, but an entirely different case. And it even came about in a bizarre way. In 2007, so we're talking years and years later, Tommy was hired as a police officer at the Trotwood Police Department, which was a neighboring town. When Richmond PD heard wind of this, they were flabbergasted, like to say the absolute least, because he was still a main person of interest in the disappearance of Nikki, and they couldn't understand why a police department would knowingly hire someone who was a person of interest in an ongoing investigation. So they decided to go to Trotwood Police Department and ask, what the heck are you thinking? Well, they quickly got their answer when Trotwood Police Department told them that they didn't even know. This was not something that Tommy disclosed to them when he should have. At this point, he'd only been working for Trotwood PD for I believe about two months and they gave him two choices. You can either resign and go quietly or we're going to fire you right now. He decided to resign, but he was not going to go down without being as loud as he possibly could and it would end up getting him a lot more attention than he thought it was going to and probably not the attention that he was hoping for. Upon resigning, Tommy decided to hire a lawyer and sue the city of Richmond and the Richmond Police Department. He claimed that they had never disclosed to him that he was a person of interest and that he, and he said that he was very cooperative the entire time during the investigation when he was being questioned about Nikki and he genuinely believed he was innocent and they weren't looking at him anymore and that they had ruined his career. Now a heated debate began because of this, because Richmond Police Department was able to prove that they did in fact inform him that he was a person of interest and that he also was very far from cooperative. And this argument ended up pushing him into 
trying to prove he was cooperative in order to, I think in his eyes, win the lawsuit, but it came back to bite him later. Richmond Police Department said, if you were so cooperative, if you're claiming to be so cooperative, why didn't you give us your DNA? And to this, he said, fine, I'll give you my DNA. Ultimately, regardless of what he thought would happen, Tommy did not win the lawsuit and he moved to Alabama to escape the criticism. But his many press conferences put him in the eyes of the public. Shortly after the lawsuit, authorities in Dayton, Ohio received an anonymous tip. This person said that they had seen Tommy on the news when all of the lawsuits were happening and they strongly believed that authorities needed to look into his involvement in the 1991 murder of 33-year-old Tina Marie Ivory. Totally not what anybody's expecting. This is an entirely different case. Tina was living in Dayton, Ohio at the time that she was murdered. She was a sex worker and had been found dumped in a pile of trash. There was, I guess, this area where people would just go dump their trash on the side of the road in the woods and leave it. And she was found there. She was wrapped in a blanket, tied up with duct tape, um, and she had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled. Now, at the time, authorities were in fact able to retrieve DNA from the attacker, but they had no persons of interest, no suspects. They basically had nothing in this case other than that. So they weren't ever able to identify who this DNA belonged to. Well, now they have someone that's put in a tip that says, hey, this guy, he could possibly be involved in this. When authorities in Dayton looked into all this information, they realized that Tommy was also a person of interest in this ongoing Richmond Police Department investigation about the disappearance of Nikki. Now they called over and said, you know, what's going on with this? We have another case that he could potentially be involved in and we have DNA and Richmond Police Department said, well, guess what? Due to our most recent lawsuit, we have Tommy's DNA and we will give it to you because they figured if it was a match and he was linked to this other murder of this young woman in Dayton, Ohio, that they could then use that as leverage to see if he was also involved in Nikki's disappearance. Dayton Police Department took the DNA, did forensic testing, and you guessed it, it was a match. At this point, they had the DNA linking Tommy to at least Tina Marie Ivory, but this didn't necessarily prove that he was the killer. They needed to prove that he was in some way at the crime scene. So with new forensic testing, they decided to go over every single bit of evidence and they managed to find a palm print on the tape that was used to wrap up her body in the blanket. They were able to lift this palm print and then use one of the fingerprints from the palm print. And their plan was to basically go down to Alabama, confront Tommy with this information, ask for his fingerprint and hope that they got it. And surprisingly, it was very, very easy. They went, approached him at his new correctional facility where he worked um, and he gave them his fingerprint. And sure enough, that was a match as well. Sorry about the noise that you may hear in the background at this point, it just started absolutely pouring outside. But this meant that Tommy was Tina's killer. And not only did those close to him claim that he was aggressive, he had gone so far as to murder a woman for who even knows what reason. Authorities believe this likely was not the first time. They went back to Alabama, Dayton police did, and they approached Tommy hoping to maybe get a confession or see if they could get any information from him. And they confronted him. They said that they had DNA evidence proving that he had killed Tina Marie Ivory. He did seem a little shocked, but I feel like not as shocked as you would assume someone would look. Uh, and he ended up asking for a lawyer and ending the interview and he left. At this point, Dayton Police Department was moving. They were ready to indict him, send Alabama officers to arrest him. And that's exactly what happened that February of 2010. Alabama officers approached Tommy's home to arrest him for the murder of Tina Marie Ivory. And when they approached, they heard a gunshot. And upon entering his home, they found Tommy dead. He had ended his life. Tina's family that had waited 20 years for justice, finally got her killer after years and years of questioning who would dump this woman on the side of the road, who would kill her the way that they did and then throw her away like trash. And now there was no way real justice could be given. Nikki's family that had been waiting anxiously after hearing this connection and thinking that this man they believed was potentially responsible for a very long time 
you know, believing they would get answers from him now that he was going to be arrested in another murder. This was ripped away from them as well. Authorities and the victim's families were devastated. It was like two cases that had been silent for years could have come to a close and he took the cowardly way out. And it became even more devastating the more that they looked into information. Upon further searching, authorities began to think that Tommy was actually a serial killer, that Tina Marie Ivory was not his first victim, that there were many others, um, even apart from Nikki, that they believed, you know, according to investigators on her case now, fully believed that Tommy was responsible. He had a pattern and there was no telling how many victims he had out there. Despite his death, Tina's family now at least has some questions answered and Richmond Police Department is not giving up and they strongly believe there is another way to get more information and Nikki's family agrees with this. So as I stated, there was this woman that Tommy was dating at the time and they lived in the same apartment complex. They all worked at the same correctional facility and this is who Nikki called that day. And her sister Michelle has stated that she believes it was for these vitamins possibly. And there was no other reason anyone could think of that she would have been in Dayton. She wasn't going to see Steven. He was cleared, he had an alibi at the time. Um, she wasn't there for him. There had to have been another reason. I personally wonder if this woman lured Nikki in for Tommy. Some have wondered why she wouldn't have come forward after Tommy passed away. A lot of people wondered if maybe she was just someone that he was manipulating and um, they believed after he ended his life that maybe she would come forward and want to clear her conscience, but she didn't. So it makes a lot of people wonder, including me, if she was potentially involved. That's the only other explanation I can personally think of. Maybe Nikki was a threat. If you think about it, Tommy was infatuated with Nikki. There was a rumor spreading around that they were, you know, in some sort of romantic relationship. It makes me wonder if Tommy was maybe mad at Nikki for not reciprocating these feelings. She clearly completely denied him when he made sexual advances and he was planning on taking it there anyways. Um, you know, had he wanted to get rid of her from his anger of feeling denied. I just feel like it's potential if there was this woman involved, if he had this girlfriend, she knew all this was going on. She knew he had this, she likely knew he had this infatuation with Nikki since people at work seemed to be talking about it. And what if she agreed with him? If, if he was mad and said he wanted to take her out and she wants her out of the picture as well, I can see where that help would come in. Authorities as recently as 2019 have stated that this woman is on a list of people to talk to. I have no idea if they've spoken to her yet, um, but I agree that it's very possible that this woman knows a lot more than she is letting on. It's very possible that Nikki was lured into the apartment, you know, by claims of having these vitamins. Or I also wonder if she was in some sort of argument with Tommy's girlfriend and that was the real reason that she was upset that day. Had the girlfriend maybe confronted her about the fact that there were rumors going around that her and her boyfriend Tommy were in some sort of relationship and it made her mad? Did Nikki maybe go over there to try to straighten things out and something happened? Um, you know, the seat had not been moved in the car and a lot of people were saying, okay, but if she was over there at Tommy's, how did her car get there and the seat wasn't moved, no other DNA or anything was found? I think it's very possible someone wiped it clean or maybe someone Nikki's size drove the car. So it makes me wonder if Tommy's girlfriend at the time was her size. Clearly, he had experience with killing someone before. So maybe he instructed her on how to keep DNA away from things. Again, this is all just speculation, but I can't say that that's not out of the realm of possibilities. I think it's very likely that Tommy as well knew that Nikki had an ex-boyfriend who was the father of her child living near him. And I think it's possible that the car was put there in hopes of staging him because, you know, it would make sense. Oh, this woman's been killed weeks before her wedding. Maybe her ex is angry. You know, the father of her child is mad. I do wonder how the car remained there for three months. And I wonder if it actually did or if it had recently been placed. I wonder if Tommy had a garage somewhere or friends that he could have kept a car at because I feel like being in a neighborhood like that, especially one where Steven lived there and he was aware that Nikki was missing, that the car would have been noticed very quickly. So I wonder if it was placed there 
shortly before it was found. This is just frustrating to me because it seems like her case is narrowed down and this one person seems to have the answers. There was even a point in time where a $20,000 reward was put up in hopes of bringing someone forward. It was for a short period of time, but no one came forward. And so many people have said, well, that means no one knows anything. But to me, it just screams, if someone does know something, the only reason they wouldn't come forward is because A, they were scared of him, or B, they were involved and just don't want to come forward knowing that they have their own guilt. There are a handful of people that believe that she was just a victim of circumstance and that all of this information is just coincidence. And I am not one to believe in coincidences. I've made this very clear on my channel, but it's kind of hard with this case because there seems like so much coincidental information in regards to Bobby and even in regards to Steven and the car being found there. So I don't know how much more likely there could just be more coincidences in this case. that So it's just a coincidence that this man appeared to be obsessed with her and had tried to sexually assault her before. She called his girlfriend that day and the same day she calls her, you know, she goes missing and her car is found a fourth of a mile away from the home. I don't know how many more coincidences could happen in this case, honestly. I also have really started to think about the fact that she told her family, her mom, that there were two men at the laundromat that were harassing her. And her family even stated that they believe this could have potentially been a cover. Um, what if there were two other individuals that she was talking about, but she just didn't wanna speak about it to them right at that moment? And what if she was just saying it was two individuals at the laundromat when really it was two other individuals, possibly Tommy and Tommy's girlfriend that she was speaking about? Given the fact that she left confident at that point and said, you know what, I'm gonna handle it, I'm fine. I think it's possible that's exactly what she went to do. What if she went to go pick up her laundry and went down there to confront them about whatever situation was going on? Current investigator in this case seems very dedicated. I do not think she's going to give up on this case at all. I think it's so close to being solved. I think the right buttons just have to be pushed. Nikki's family has told True Crime Daily that they really, really hope that this woman comes forward and decides to tell authorities what she knows because that pretty much seems like the only hope left in this case. This woman was doing so many good things in life and had so many good goals and so many people that she cared about and so many people that she impacted in such a positive way. And the fact that she has still not been found and foul play is likely involved absolutely breaks my heart. And I hope this family has some sort of answers because they have never given up. This family has continuously pushed over and over and over again to keep her story out there and to get answers for her. And I genuinely hope that they get it. So let me know what you think down below. Obviously the main theory is that Tommy was involved and now he's no longer here to give anyone any answers, but authorities strongly believe that this woman is out there and she knows a lot more than she's letting on, even if he just in passing mentioned it to her. Um, I personally think there's a huge chance there's way more involvement in that based on you know, different aspects that I'm seeing and different scenarios that could have played out, but I'm not a professional. So let me know what you guys think down below. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Nikki's story. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howland fam, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.